well. Um, so as a lot of you already know, our speaker today is Alex Chow from Mock. We're really excited to have him. Um, I was excited to invite him because I had seen that he hadn't talked here since 2009 or so. And, you know, he's one of the few people who I, you know, get excited whenever I see an archive preprint from him. So sort of a research role model um, and, uh, you know, great to have him here in person. Um, uh, so he's done a lot of great work over the years, at the intersection of optimization, machine learning and signal processing. And for that one, you know, numerous awards, including the SIAM Optimization Award and the NSF Career Award. And uh, not content with just having an academic career, Alex recently co-founded uh, a, a, a data analytics company. And as Jamal said, I should stop sucking up. And uh, let's go ahead and start <laughs> talk on diversity, feature selection, and the shapely Bulkman theorem. Thanks, Alex, for coming. Yep. Thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm uh, always uh, happy to be back uh, at Cornell, uh, even as an avatar. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about sparsity, feature selection, and the shapley folkman theorem. But I should start by saying that this is joint work with Armin Askari, who's a PhD at Berkeley, and Laurent Elgawi, his advisor, and Kantar Rebjok, who is now doing a PhD at EPFL. So all the great stuff is, is there in there, uh, really uh, uh, came from them. Um, and so uh, basically my talk is going to be a mix of uh, a, a piece of statistics, a piece of convex uh, geometry, and a piece of optimization. And so I'll start by talking about feature selection, but then you see that we'll switch to convex geometry and, and come back to optimization. So hopefully there will be a little bit uh, for everyone. So I'll start by the statistical part, and the idea here is to focus on uh, feature selection. And, and what's the general idea of a feature selection? Well, you're in a prediction task or in a classi classification task, and you want to reduce the number of uh, model variables while preserving uh, classification performance. And uh, that's a, a good idea from a purely statistical perspective because the, the variables that really do not help your classification task essentially act as noise. And if you can get rid of that noise, you typically improve classification performance at, at the test uh, stage. So from a statistical perspective, feature selection usually helps. But there's an additional benefit to doing feature selection that is perhaps more important, which is that it helps interpretation. So it, it produces a short list of variables that have the highest impact on your classification task or on your regression task. And, and usually these variables have a deeper meaning. Uh, and, and if they are actionable, they tell you where you can do something about your problem or where to look. Um, so that's a, a very old uh, problem. It's, it's well covered. There are a number of methods performing uh, feature selection in classification. Lasso is an example. L1 constraint logistic regression is another one. Recursive feature elimination for super vector machine is also a classic. All of this has been implemented uh, at industrial scale in many packages. So it, it's a very well understood uh, set of, of, of methods. The reason why feature selection is popular and usually a good idea is because in general, we are lucky. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, I, I'm going to try to illustrate this on an RNA classification problem where uh, you have a number of samples of, of uh, uh, cell uh, DNA sequences uh, covering about 35,000 genes. And let's say you have something like 2,600 examples, and you try to, to um, uh, solve a classification problem on these examples to uh, discriminate between a lung cancer cells and a control, right? You do that, and then you perform feature selection, and you plot the uh, optimum objective reached as a function of the maximum number of variables that you are allowed to select, okay? And what you find is this steeply concave curve here. And that picture turns out to be fairly generic. And what that pictures, picture tells you is that even if you select a, a fairly small or relatively small number of variables here, for example, 5,000, you typically capture a majority of the signal, right? And this trade-off between number of variables and uh, a, a statistical performance is usually pretty good, meaning that you don't lose much by selecting a small subset of variables, but you make your model a lot more tractable. 
And here the idea, for example, would be to look at the first variables that show up in this classification problem of cancers versus control, and look at the corresponding genes and try to infer a mechanism behind the disease, okay? Please do not try this at home. This is an example I run very quickly to illustrate <laughs> the, the general phenomenon, but, but it's, it's quite likely that at this level of naivete, the, the, the genes don't mean, this list of genes doesn't mean anything. But that's the general idea. You want to not only improve um, a statistical performance by removing some noise, but you also want to produce a short list of potentially actionable variables. And, and again, in natural data sets, the trade-off between number of variables and a training error is usually very, very good. Um, another example that's a bit more visual uh, that illustrates the idea of feature selection in classification is this example in, in mapping brain activity using fMRI data. So here you place patients inside a gigantic fMRI machine um, and you ask them to perform certain tasks, like image recognition, for example, while their brain is being scanned actively by the machine, their brain activity is being scanned. And the idea of these studies is to map certain activities to certain regions of the brain. These machines produce a signal that is quite noisy, so you want to, to regularize the classification results you're producing. And you also want to localize the result because, again, the idea is to isolate certain regions of the brain. And one way to do that is to do feature selection. So here, each, each variable is a particular voxel in the patient's brain. And you want to select a small list of active voxels corresponding to a particular task, right? So this is an illustration coming from the Parietal team at Inaya near Paris. Okay, and so uh, again, you can see that it, it makes sense. If you apply L1 penalization, you get a, a result that's much more localized than the one you would get by, by using L2. And, and typically, the results are much easier to interpret. Um, I, I should start by uh, or conclude this discussion, uh, sorry, about uh, feature selection with one important caveat. Uh, so in this fMRI example, for, uh, you have a number of variables that is quite high, uh, and it is the, the voxels, and a fairly limited number of samples. But in addition to that, uh, what you're really uh, uh, looking for or scanning when you're doing feature selection is a set of subsets. Okay, You're looking for a particular set of k variables inside a list of n variables. This means that, in essence, what you're doing with this statistical problem is scanning an exponentially large list of hypotheses uh, with a fairly limited number of samples. And this is a wonderful recipe for false discovery. And, and you have to be very careful. And, and in fact, there was a little bit too much enthusiasm about these fMRI experiments. People would discover incredible uh, correlation patterns between certain tasks and certain regions of the brain. Things went a little bit too far. And a small group of scientists decided to illustrate this risk of false discovery in a very concrete manner. And so they took a dead salmon, uh, previously frozen, and put the dead salmon inside this, this gigantic fMRI machine. And, and duly presented the, the dead salmon with a number of tasks to perform. And they recorded this, the dead salmon's brain activity. And sure enough, they found important variables correlated with the tasks being performed by the dead salmon. OK? So um, uh, again, even though we have a, a very effective techniques to perform a feature selection, this doesn't mean that it should uh, uh, always be taken <laughs> uh, as uh, uh, at face value. And, and there are important statistical issues involved in exploiting the variables selected by these procedures. So there's an entire field called post-selection inference, which tries to produce confidence bounds or uh, bounds on the false discovery rate using techniques such as knockoff to guarantee that the variables you, you actually discover turn out to be significant, uh, but that's another story. But again, even if we can do it, 
it's not always a good idea and you should be careful with what you get in the end. Uh, and the dead salmon experiment is there to illustrate this in a fairly striking way. Um, so in, in practice, from an optimization perspective, what, what kind of problem are we looking at? Well, one classical way of performing feature selection is to solve a lasso-like problem. So uh, Lee squares, uh, 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 second, uh, so, sorry, uh, Neuclidean loss with um, uh, an L1 penalty on a linear support vector machine, for example where you have a hinge loss and a, a regularizer. Um, in both cases, behind uh, your classification task lies a linear model. And you perform feature selection by looking at the weights inside this linear model. And variables that you can prune out are typically variables for which the corresponding weight is small enough or zero, right? And if you're looking at very large data sets, these, these techniques turn out to, be, to have fairly high complexity, right? On the other hand, they have relatively good performance, and, and we can actually certify recovery of the support under a number of assumptions that, that look at correlation in very specific ways. So hypotheses like incoherence, restricted isometry, et cetera. So this is at one end of the spectrum from an algorithmic and statistical perspective. At the other end, you have univariate techniques that are much cheaper, things like TF-IDF in text classification, ANOVA, etc. These work viable by viable. They are, they are very cheap, but statistically speaking, their performance is relatively low. And so these methods sit at the other end of the spectrum, very cheap but low statistical performance. And the idea today is to try to, to find some kind of compromise, something in between these univariate techniques and the more involved uh, linear classification methods. So we're going to start by uh, coming back to, some, to, to a variation of an ultra-classical method called naive Bayes uh, and, and see if, if we can produce a sparse version uh, to perform basically feature selection with naive Bayes. And, and try to assess the performance of, of that variation. So I, again, I'll start with a little bit of statistics and, and, um, and uh, 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 maximum likelihood, and then we'd switch to convex geometry and, and something closer to optimization. So naive Bayes in a multinomial model uh, means solving a maximum likelihood problem that looks like this. And, and the reason you don't usually see this problem in, uh, formulated as a maximum likelihood is that it's, it has a closed form solution. Uh, and so naive base is usually extremely easy to solve. F plus and F minus are, are the vectors corresponding to the features of positive and, uh, and negative samples, respectively. And so you solve this convex maximization problem that turns out to be separable, et cetera. And so uh, 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 solving naive Bayes is extremely cheap. It has linear complexity. Uh, and what people really don't necessarily exploit after solving this maximum likelihood problem is that there is, in fact, a, a simple linear classification model uh, uh, based on, on naive Bayes that looks like this. And the, the weight vector W uh, is actually given by the difference between the logarithm of the uh, positive coefficient vector and the negative coefficient vector. Why is this important? Well, it means that when theta plus and theta minus coincide for a certain variable, the corresponding weight in the linear classification rule is zero, and the variable is not selected by the model. So if you want to perform a feature selection in naive Bayes, you want this vector W to have as many zeros as possible, or at most k non-zero coefficients, say. So you want the coefficients of theta plus and theta minus to match for all but k variables, right? So we can write this down explicitly and, and form a, a sparse version of the naive base problem. So we still have the likelihood objective, the, the constraints on theta plus and theta minus, but now we have these extra constraints that forces the coefficients of theta plus and theta minus to be equal for all but k of the variables. And of course, the naive base problem, the original one, was very easy to solve. The sparse version is, is typically NP-complete. We don't have a reduction, but it's kind of easy to, uh, to, uh, to uh, let's say, 
the odds that it's NP complete are close enough to one that uh, we can move on. <laughs> um, and so, so the question is, now that we have this sort of variation on naive base that enforces sparsity in model selection, uh, can we solve it? Or at least can we solve an approximation of that problem? And if, if yes, can we get approximation bounds? Right, it's a non-convex problem, but we want guarantees on performance. Um, and the, the, the answer to the first question is, is fairly straightforward, actually. It, it, it's Yes, we it's easy to find a, 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 a convex relaxation and solve it. It turns out that the dual is an univariate convex optimization problem, which consists in minimizing uh, this function sk of h of alpha, where sk is the sum of the k largest coefficients of the vector h of alpha, which depends on the variable alpha between 0 and 1. And h of alpha is this simple ve vector uh, uh, constructed from the positive and uh, uh, negative feature vectors and the variable alpha itself. Okay? Solving a one-dimensional convex optimization problem is something we can do fairly efficiently. And it turns out that the complexity is, in fact, uh, big O of n plus k log k. And since k is typically small in most of these examples, because we are trying to do feature selection, uh, the complexity of solving this, this convex relaxation is essentially linear. So it's not that much more expensive than the naive Bayes problem itself, right? So that's good news. It means at least the sparse variation of naive Bayes is not that much harder to, uh, to solve than the original one. And we still get roughly linear complexity. Now, that's nice, but if, if the solution is miles away from the truth, it's not very helpful. And so what we need next is good approximation bounds, right? And here, the, 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 the story takes an interesting twist. And this is where we sort of switch to uh, convex geometry. Um, so I, I should start by two quick reminders. Mm, two um, uh, properties. And first, the definition, the Minkowski sum. Uh, you're certainly familiar with it, but it never hurts. Um, so if you take two sets, x and y in RD, and you take their sum, their Minkowski sum, x plus y, that's simply the set of vectors written x plus y with x in x and y in y, right? Fairly logical. And you get an example here uh, with two uh, polytopes P and Q and their Minkowski sum, which is a slightly larger polytope. The property that's going to be important for us in what follows is the fact that uh, Minkowski sum and convex hulls commute. So that the convex hull of the sum, Minkowski sum of sets VI is also the Minkowski sum of the convex hulls of the sets VI, right? So you'll see why we care about this later. So why on earth do we care about Minkowski sums? Well, uh, it turns out that uh, the Minkowski sum has a convexification effect. I don't know if convexification is in the Larousse, but uh, you probably sort of understand what I mean. Uh, uh, let's take an example uh, and the L1 half ball, which is here. What happens if we form the mean of two L1 half balls? So mean in the sense of Minkowski sum. Uh, the set we get looks like this. Now suppose we take the mean, the average of 10 L1 half balls. The set we, look, we get looks like this. And asymptotically, we converge to the L1 ball, which turns out to be the convex hull of the L1 half ball, okay? So that's true of, of the, the Minkowski average of uh, identical sets like this L1 half ball. It's also true for the sum of arbitrary sets that have about the same scale. And we can illustrate these on these highly non-convex uh, sets, which are digits here, uh, one, two, three, four, five, taken as uh, point sets. If I compute their Minkowski sum by, by sampling, because it's a hard set to form, the set I get is, is something like this. I scaled it down for visibility, for, for clarity, but the Minkowski sum of one, two, three, four, five is this sort of blob here that looks like zero. So arithmetically, it's not totally sound, but geometrically, it's interesting because this set is close and quite close to, to being convex. Even though I took um, uh, five sets that were pretty far from being convex, uh, 
fairly different from one another, but, but that they, they, the only point is that they had about the same size. And the good news is that we can make this convexification effect uh, completely explicit. And this is actually what Chaplin and Falkman did in the 60s. Okay, and their result states the following. So take uh, uh, n sets vi in dimension d, okay, and take a point x in the convex hull of their Minkowski sum. This is also a point x in the Minkowski sum of the convex hulls of the vi. Uh, and what the chaplet fokman theorem tells you is that you can actually find another representation, exact representation of this point x as the sum of at most d vectors in the convex hulls of the VI for a certain subset S of the indices uh, with S uh, of size uh, D at most, plus uh, N minus D uh, vectors in the original sets VI, right? And why is this exactly what we care about? Well, suppose all of the VIs have about the same size. Um, and suppose now D, the dimension is fixed, and the number of sets goes to infinity or grows, right? What happens is that because this sum here is limited to D terms, right? As the number of sets N grows to infinity, this sum here is going to become negligible compared to this one. And what the chaplet fokman theorem then shows is that for any point in the convex hull of the Minkowski sum of the VIs, the same point can be written as the sum of a small term in the sum of the convex hulls of the VIs plus a, a, a dominant term where X is written as the sum of vectors in the original sets VI, right? And this means that the difference between this set here, sum of VI and the convex hull is getting smaller as N goes to infinity and D remains fixed. And this is exactly what we want, okay? And the proof is fairly simple, so let's do it. Um, so why does this happen? Well, sorry. Um, well, suppose X is in the uh, Minkowski sum of the convex hulls of the VI, right? Another way to write this is to sort of include the normalization constraints in an expanded vector, augment the, the, this, the relationship with the normalization constraints, and write that the vector x1 is a conic combination of vectors vij, uh, ei, where ei is the Euclidean basis, for non-negative coefficients lambda, right? So below I have listed all the normalization constraints, and above I just have the, the sum uh, of, uh, of terms uh, of vectors uh, vi in the convex hulls. okay? Each vij belongs to the set vi. Now I have a conic representation of X one in dimension N plus D, and I can invoke conic character theory to show that there must be another conic representation of X one with at most N plus D non-zero coefficients, right? Just conic character theory. And now I can use a sort of pigeonhole argument. I have N plus D non-zero coefficients lambda J, lambda ij, and I need uh, at least um, n of them, one, so, sorry, one of them per set vi to satisfy the normalization constraints, right? So I'm already uh, attributing one of these non-zero coefficients to each of the set vi. So n of them are gone, I'm left with d of them to spread between the n sets. And this means that for uh, uh, at most D sets in this list, I have a non-trivial uh, convex hull uh, uh, representation uh, of the, the corresponding vector. So, so for all these uh, sets where two uh, of the lambda i's are non-zero and the, the convex combination is non-trivial, xi is going to be in the convex hull of vi. On the other hand, for all these sets where I only have a single non-zero uh, co co coefficient lambda ij, xi is in the original set vi, right? Uh, 
So for all of these non-trivial co convex uh, combinations, the set is in the convex hull, but otherwise for all the others, the set is in the original set. In other words, the number of non-zero coefficients lambda ij controls the gap with the convex hull. If this number is very small, most of the xi components will be in the original sets, and the difference between the original, the, the Minkowski sum and its convex hull will be small. If, on the other hand, many of these lambda ij are non-zero, then the difference will be larger. But otherwise, shapley hopman is just a direct consequence of uh, uh, Konica Theodori. So we can make this convergence uh, result a bit more explicit and show, for example, using the previous result that if, again, all of the VIs have relatively the same, roughly the same size, so that their radius, for example, is uniform, uh, uniformly bounded by R, then the host of distance between the, the, their mean and the convex hull of the mean is bounded by R times this normalization term divided by N. Uh, and so we can show convergence for the host of distance. And it turns out that you can also show convergence uh, of the Minkowski sum towards its convex hull uh, in many other uh, measures of, of uh, uh, distance between sets or non-convexity. And there's a very nice paper by Fradelizzi and others in 2017 listing a number of non-convexity measures that converge to zero as n goes to infinity. So it, you're not limited to those of distance um, here uh, by far. So that's the sort of convex geometry uh, uh, aspect to it. And the question is, what does that mean for uh, our optimization problems? And it turns out that this chaplet hopman result allows you to uh, provide fairly explicit uh, a priori bounds on the duality gap of certain separable optimization problems. And this is what we're going to use here. Um, and so the class of problems we're going to look at here are these uh, separable finite sum minimization problems, where you minimize the sum of the fi of xi, subject to linear constraints. And provided some classical te technical con regularity conditions on the functions fi, the, the good news about this problem format is that uh, uh, it's very easy to form a convex relaxation by just taking the dual twice. And the dual twice, the, sorry, the, the, the second dual of these problems simply replaces the original functions by their convex envelope. Uh, and so this problem here is, in fact, the uh, second dual of, of this one. The convex envelope has a very classical interpretation as the sort of tightest lower bound approxi uh, convex approximation to the original function. So for the cardinality or the indicator function of uh, x different from zero, you get something like the absolute value as a convex lower bound. What's important for us is that the uh, convex lower bound, so f star star and the original function, match at extreme points of the epigraph of the convex envelope. Why do we care? Well, it turns out that for the particular separable um, uh, optimization problem I just listed, the epigraph is a Minkowski sum of elementary epigraphs of these convex envelope functions. And there you should start to see where I'm trying to go, okay? If the epigraph of my problem uh, is a Minkowski sum of these sort of elementary epigraphs, and the number of terms in the sum grows to infinity, while the dimension of these epigraphs remains constant, this epigraph, the epigraph of my problem, is going to become increasingly convex. And that basically means that the duality gap itself will go to zero. What's happening here is that these elementary epigraphs have dimension m plus 1, where m is the number of constraints, not the dimension, the ambient dimension. right? So if the number of coupling constraints becomes remains constant, while the number of terms in the sum grows to infinity, I get in, in that nice regime where uh, the epigraph of my problem becomes increasingly convex, and the duality gap uh, gets closer and closer to zero. And I can provide, in, in that scenario, in fact, explicit a priori bounds on um, 
the duality gap of, of my problem. And in fact, this, this result dates back from the 70s. The one I'm quoting here is slightly more uh, generic, but the original result is due to Aubin and Eklund uh, in 76, I think. Um, and the, the more generic result I'm quoting here is important because this is the one I'm going to use for naive Bayes. But basically, it says that if I start from an optimization problem written like this, that is separable, and separability here is absolutely key. It's what gives this Minkowski sum structure to the epigraph. Um, and I write a slight, uh, slightly more uh, involved version of that problem, including a perturbation term u on the constraints. Then what the chapel um theorem implies for this sort of problem is that uh, I can sandwich the optimum value of the original problem taken at a, a perturbed value of the par perturbation parameter equal to p bar. This, this optimum, which is typically intractable, can be sandwiched bounded below by the uh, second dual of this optimization problem and above at the at p bar and bounded above by, again, the second dual of this optimization problem at perturbation zero plus m plus one times the max of rho of FRA. So what are these two terms that basically control the error? This one measures the non-convexity of the objective functions. So rho of Fi is the difference between the function and its convex envelope, right? Uh, so if the objective is convex in particular, this is zero. Same thing here for uh, rho of Gij. This measures non-convexity of the terms in the constraints. And in addition to uh, these non-convexity measures, I have the factor m plus one measuring the number of constraints. So what this result tells you is that the a priori bound on the duality gap of this separable optimization problem is proportional to two things, the non-convexity of the objective and the constraints, that's the term rho you see here, and the number of constraints, m. If, you, if your problem is loosely coupled, uh, and a typical example is the unit commitment problem where you only have a single uh, budget constraint or production constraint, uh, then your duality gap is going to be low, okay? If your problem is highly coupled, uh, then your duality gap is going to increase. And basically, the duality gap itself is proportional, directly proportional to the number of constraints. So why do we care about this problem? It's because about this result is that it, be, it applies directly to this sparse naive base problem, right? If I look back at the sparse version of the naive base uh, maximum likelihood problem, uh, it fits exactly this format of uh, non-convex separable optimization problem with a, a small number of constraints. In fact, here, uh, I only have three constraints in my sparse naive base problem, the two normalization constraints and the sparsity constraint, right? So if I uh, invoke this uh, Temam and Eklund result in the, for the sparse naive base problem, the, the bounds I get on the duality gap become particularly simple. They show that uh, phi k, the optimum value of the sparse naive base problem, the non-convex one, is bounded below by psi of k minus four, uh, psi being the convex relaxation, and bounded above by psi of k. That's it. So you solve the convex relaxation, which is linear and, and marginally more expensive than the naive base problem itself. And if you get the full curve, you also get these explicit bounds on the optimum value of the original non-convex problem. That's interesting. Uh, there's also another interesting phenomenon, which is that the duality gap itself is proportional to basically the slope of the curve. And that has an interesting statistical meaning because, well, what, what, what's going on when the, when the, the, the curve becomes flat? When the curve becomes flat, it means that each additional variable that I add is not helping very much the statistical problem or the training error, right? which means that the variable that I just added is probably useless. What this bound tells you is that as soon as you're starting to add useless or irrelevant variables, 
the duality gap will become very small. And so what this result tells you is that the relaxation becomes tight as soon as you've already included all the relevant variables in your statistical task, right? And so that's, that's a fairly intuitive result uh, in practice. So I've talked a lot about naive Bayes, but there is life beyond uh, naive Bayes assumptions. And it turns out that this result can be generalized uh, to, to um, more generic uh, classification or, or, or regression tasks. And in particular, we can extend it to arbitrary losses written over low rank data, data sets. So uh, minimizations of this type, we have a loss term f of xw plus a quadratic penalty, which is there just for regularity purposes. Uh, and our main assumption here is that x is going to be low rank, right? Um, and so that's true for a convex, uh, uh, sorry, a penalized formulation with a sparsity constraint. It's true also for, uh, uh, um, sorry, a penalized formulation with the L0 norm. And so problems that fit this bill are a lasso, for example, or L0 constraint logistic regression. So highly classical uh, statistical techniques for um, feature selection. And same thing, the, the bidual of these uh, constrained or penalized problems can be written fairly explicitly. They can be solved efficiently. Uh, they turn out to be equivalent to something called the interval relaxation of the L0 uh, sparsity constraint. And it turns out that we can produce a similar approximation result uh, and, and similar bounds on the duality gap. I'm just sort of going really fast over the details here, but we get a similar uh, a set of inequalities between the optimum of the non-convex problem and the values of the relaxation for different shifts in the parameter k. So here, the, the, the optimum of the non-convex problem is bounded below by p of k plus r plus 2 and above by p of k. And something I haven't discussed at this point, but which would require a much longer conversation is primalization meaning now that you have solved the problem and you have an approximation of the objective value, how do re you recover a, a, a primal feasible solution matching these approximation bounds? And it turns out that this is a much longer story. And uh, the chaplet fokman result itself is very generic, the one I just listed from Teman and Eklan. And, and this gives you in, in very flexibly in a vast uh, range of scenarios a priori bounds on the duality gap. Getting back to primal feasible solutions satisfying these bounds takes highly customized work and is not a given at all. So getting bounds on the objective is easy by applying the theorem. Getting feasible points is another story altogether. And so I won't have time to discuss this here, but, but in this case, and for all the problems I've listed here, it turns out to be equivalent to solving an LP. Uh, and we can recover uh, efficiently uh, a primal feasible solutions, but, but this is something that is not completely generic and, and takes a little bit of work, okay? So I'm happy to discuss about this offline, but, but right now just remember that it's possible that it turns out to be an LP, but it involves um, um, some sort of interesting reformulations of the problem as non-convex optimization problems uh, involving convex epigraphs um, and hopefully solving these. Just back to the statistical perspective, uh, we're solving something that looks very much like lasso without making all the usual assumptions uh, that you have to make in, for lasso to get recovery, right? So how does that uh, sort of compare to the traditional RIP setting? Well, what's happening here is that we're getting bounds on appro approximation bounds, basically, without making any RIP lack or incoherence assumption, just the low rank one. This allows us to bound the distance uh, in terms of optimality, right? So uh, in terms of objective value. So we reach a, a, an optimum that is sort of some epsilon away from, from the truth. Uh, but in LASSO, usually you're interested in much more than approximating the optimum objective value. What you want is guarantees that you're actually recovering the support. 
And this takes additional assumptions. So there's no sort of incompatibility between what we're seeing here and the usual setting for support recovery in, in the lasso, where you need additional assumptions about your uh, design metrics to get support recovery. Here, our guarantees only apply to the objective, not to support recovery. And you need more material to guarantee support recovery. But at least what's nice is that you have this additional regime where even though you don't recover necessarily the, the unique uh, best support, you recover a support that gives you uh, uh, approximately optimal performance. So that's a sort of an interesting complement to the existing set of results on uh, a feature selection, lasso, and zero logistic regression, etc. So how does this work in practice? Well, mm. Laurent is a big fan of feature selection for text. Um, first, because um, uh, it's very easy to uh, manipulate high dimensional text data sets. And second, because feature selection gives you essentially a bag of words. And this bag of words usually has a natural interpretation uh, in terms of topics. All the words that you get in a categorization task, for example, will be words that relatively well describe the corresponding category. And so the results you get are very, very intuitive. So we tested this thing extensively on text using data sets such as Amazon, IMDb, Twitter, et cetera, and different pre-processing settings producing different uh, uh, ambient dimensions. So just counting the number of word occurrences, TF-IDF, TF-IDF on bigrams, on character bigrams, et cetera getting data sets in between, uh, with between a few thousand variables and a few million of them. And um, this table here lists basically average runtime using completely plain vanilla Python in a, on, on a CPU. Um, and what you see is that basically the, the CPU time is a one second per, per million variables, right? Which is uh, quite nice. And um, and the complexity itself, as we will see, is, is completely linear. Uh, more importantly, is statistical performance. So testing feature selection performance on natural set data sets is a bit tricky because you don't have access to the ground truth usually. So you have to design an experiment that sort of reveals feature selection perform, isolates feature selection performance, and, and does not rely on, on some kind of ground truth. So the, the way we did it is that uh, we, we did it in two stages. In the first stage, we use a variety of techniques to do feature selection and select a smaller group of variables. In the second stage, we perform a classification task using this reduced set of variables. And our idea is to use uh, the precision reached in, at the second stage in the classification task as a measure of the feature selection performance. Why? Well, if feature selection did a good job, you, you have kept at the second stage all the important variables and your statistical performance is going to be good. If on the other hand, you've thrown out all the important variables, your statistical performance at the second stage is likely to suffer. But again, this is a sort of indirect way of measuring um, um, feature selection performance. And so this, this accuracy versus um, um, statistical accuracy versus computing time trade-off of, of the various techniques we've uh, experimented with uh, are, is, is uh, listed in, in this plot. Uh, and so you have basically two groups of, of, of methods. The univariate methods I've mentioned before, thresholding the variables in a linear model using these ANOVA or TF-IDF measures. And what you get is this cloud of points over here. So very, very low training time in log scale here. But um, as soon as your model is sparse enough, relatively low accuracy. At the other end of the spectrum, you have all these uh, uh, linear models, like Lasso, Logistic L1, et cetera. OK? Much higher accuracy, but much higher computing time, like a 1,000 times more expensive than univariate techniques. And our method is somewhere in between. So we're 100 times faster, more than 100 times faster than the, the sort of classical linear techniques, let's say 10 times smaller than univariate methods, but the statistical performance does not suffer that much. 
right? And so it, it seems to be a good compromise between univariate techniques and the classical linear uh, techniques for feature selection. The duality gap picture looks uh, pretty uh, aligned with what uh, the, the uh, theory would predict. So the, in this plot here, you have psi of k, psi of k minus 4. And I remember our, our result on the duality gap told us that uh, the solution would be somewhere in between. And this is indeed, of course, what we, what we get here after primalization. This is in dimension 30, OK? That's the same picture in dimension 3,000. And again, you see here that uh, because the, the, the objective is bounded be between psi k and psi k minus 4, the duality gap in relative terms here becomes very quickly negligible. And you also see this phenomenon that as the curve flattens, the duality gap bound becomes tighter and tighter. And from a statistical perspective, this, this is meaningful because when you're in this region, the additional variables that you're uh, uh, putting into the model don't make much statistical difference. So they are essentially useless. And in, if you're in this regime where the variables you're adding are useless, it turns out that the duality gap bound becomes uh, tight. Same plot, similar plot, basically for uh, uh, on top uh, lasso and logistic regression uh, over here and over here. And you get similar bounds, which are not completely tight for very sparse solutions, be but become increasingly tighter for uh, denser ones. So it's, it's uh, clear here, let's say. And this is, again, an example where uh, we have a number of observations uh, in, in dimension 1,000 and a matrix of rank 10. So the reason we have these low bounds here, our main assumption that allows us to produce these bounds is that the underlying data set has low rank. The same thing holds, uh, albeit in a slightly more involved uh, format, if the matrix X has low numerical rank. And it turns out that, uh, and, and some of you have actually produced uh, uh, very nice papers on this, many natural data sets uh, have, uh, tend to have very low natural uh, numerical rank. That's complexity versus a number of variables. So the theory says linear. It turns out that in practice here, probably because of hardware or implementation, uh, the complexity looks a little bit uh, sublinear. Uh, but, but basically, uh, uh, the complexity is not growing much faster than the complexity of naive based. And it's actually the same as an asymptotic regime. And uh, to push the, the, the exercise a little bit further on, on the complexity front, we, we took a, a much larger data set for feature selection coming from Criteo on conversion logs. So this is basically uh, digital marketing or spam. And, um, and, and this data set has uh, 45 million rows and 50,000 columns, right? And we wanted to see how well our method would perform on, on this problem. And so on a single laptop, uh, just to keep things simple, uh, we did some pre-processing to remove NAM, encode categorical features, et cetera. And that took 50 minutes. And then we computed F plus and F minus, which are required by the naive based model. And that took 20 minutes. And, and then we, we took this information to compute the full regularization curve. So all the solutions for target sparsity ranging from 0 to 15,000. And that took two minutes. OK? So the, the, uh, what, what this means is that the complexity here is so low that the, the time it takes you to do feature selection is negligible compared to the time it takes you to do pre-processing meaning that you essentially get feature selection for free with a performance at least on text that is comparable to that of Lasso, right? which is not that, that free. And so that, that's uh, good news. Um, to be completely frank, we, we started experimenting with biological data. Uh, and there, the, the comparison with Lasso is, is a bit more mixed. And so we, we don't have uh, the kind of uh, uh, explicit uh, uh, benefit that we get for text uh, information. Uh, but but uh, our expertise on, on biological data sets is not uh, particularly spectacular. And so there's probably some kind of interesting pre-processing that, that, that would help here, but we are not there yet. So just to summarize and conclude, 
Um, so the idea today is that if you remember at least one thing from this talk is that for naive Bayes, you, you can get sparsity almost for free, right? Why? Because, well, the complexity of the relaxation remains linear, so it, it's not more expensive than the naive base solution itself. We have a nearly tight relaxation, and it's tight when it matters, when your model is complete. And the feature selection performance is, is in statistical terms, is comparable to that of lasso or L1 logistic regression, but it's 100 times faster on text. And it requires no restrict complex, like restricted isometry property, et cetera. Uh, only just the, the naive assumption behind naive base, which is a strong one, but it's, it's uh, classical. And for these extensions to lasso and L0 uh, uh, regression, you make a low rank assumption on your data, which is also fairly natural in, in many uh, scenarios. So if you're interested in, in reading more about these results, there, there are two preprints out, one on ArcSieve on naive base, and a second one uh, more recent on these extensions to lasso and L0 logistic regression. And we also have code on GitHub uh, uh, on uh, naive feature selection that you're welcome to test. That's it. Thank you again for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer questions. All right, thanks so much, Alex. Um, so uh, do any folks have questions they want to get to? Sid. Um, that was a great talk. So I, I guess one question about naive base, one other sort of huge reason why naive base is used is it's sort of a compression method that when you're getting data on the fly, there's a sort of very low rank or a very small representation of the data that you're storing and it's easy to update. So is there a sort of natural sort of easy update for this method as well, or do you just have to do it as a batch? Uh, good point. I don't think we looked at that. Um, there should be, but uh, I, I can't answer that off the top of my head, but that's a good idea. Yeah. And I agree that all you need as a description of your data is F plus and F minus. And that's, of course, very comfortable. So it would yeah. make a lot of sense. I, I, I sort of remember we tried and couldn't get anything cheap. Uh, uh, or at least cheaper than the original method itself, which is already quite cheap. Uh, but but I may be wrong. No, yeah, it wasn't obvious. I mean, it did seem like at the end there was a sparse representation, but it was unclear if, like, in a streaming sense, you sort of lose information um, when you store it on, or maybe you need to store it a little more in order to not lose. But maybe it, yes. It, uh, but but it, uh, that's an excellent idea because indeed one of the main benefits of of this is f plus f minus, and that's that's what explains most of the speed advantage uh, in this very large scale experiment on on the critical data set, for example. Thanks, Mike. You're muted. Sorry, I was dumb. Um, so when you had your your comparison uh, of the performance on the optimal value, the approximation bounds, and support recovery, that's basically the the dead salmon thing that sometimes you can do very well on the objective function, but uh, useless in terms of any prediction. Uh, yes and no. So. In, in very particular regimes uh, where you can show RIP, so these are not practical statements because there's no way to test RIP, et cetera. So it, they, they don't really, uh, there, are no, there are no guarantees for natural matrices. But in these settings where RIP holds, you're guaranteed exact support recovery. And so you, uh, you, you, there is this underlying assumption that your model is sparse uh, and, and you recover it. But, but that's a very, very extreme setting and in practice, when you use your uh, method outside of this regime, you typically make false discoveries. And in that case, you need to sort of uh, produce confidence intervals for your uh, model coefficients, or at least for your support, right? And doing that is tricky because your coefficients do not come out of a very simple statistical estimator that's univariate, but they, they come from a procedure which is 
L1 penalized regression, for example. And producing confidence bounds for coefficients coming out of this procedure is a tough task. People have tried sort of direct methods to do so, but there are also more indirect ways to, uh, to test the validity of the support you extract. And these involve techniques like knockoffs, uh, which roughly speaking produce dummy variables that look very much like your observations, but have no correlation whatsoever with the uh, uh, labels. And so you know you should never be selecting these variables by construction. And, and the way uh, uh, sort of you control the false discovery rate in this setting is that you stop including variables uh, as soon as you see these dummy variables show up in your selection. Okay, I've oversimplified massively, but that's the idea. And the good news about this setting is that it, it in, it's very independent of the algorithm you're using somehow. And so uh, you could very well use it uh, combined with uh, sparse naive Bayes. And so it's an additional procedure you need to run before uh, you perform feature selection to, to produce this sort of control set of observations. And then you perform feature selection on the full set and, and you decide where to stop in your selection based on the number of dummy variables you're, se you mm -hmm. you're selecting, okay? So it's an independent, it's, the good news is that you don't have to handle the two issues at the same time. You, you can pick your favorite feature selection procedure. You augment your data set with these dummy variables and you combine the two to control the false discovery rate and hopefully the salmon comes alive. Thanks. Yep. Um, this isn't directly related to your talk, but more to Shapley Fultman. Um, what was it? You, I, I seem to remember it was a, a big thing in economics that it's related to gain theory or equilibrium versus. Do, do you remember how that works? I mean, it's always intriguing when these geometric thing comes up in in very different. Yeah, I, I think it's a very simplified uh, way to. Uh, uh, look at the general equilibrium problem when utilities are non-convex or non-concave, in fact. Uh, but in optimization, it's mostly famous for showing low duality gap for unit commitment problems in electricity production, for mm. example. Okay. And in that case, the good news is that you only have one coupling constraint and many power plants. And so thank, th thankfully for us, uh, stabilizing the grid does not turn out to be NP hard in a bad way. And so that's the main application in, in um, OR. And in economics, it came from general like equilibrium uh, questions. Cool, other questions? I, I was curious a little bit about your experiments, like if you compared against any like mixed integer programming solvers, like. I know Bert, Sim, uh, Bert, uh, Bert Simis has had a lot of recent work, you know, where he's sort of solving uh, large scale lasso problems with an integer programming solver. I, I wonder whether you've compared against anything like that. Um, we we didn't try, but 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 if you have a good benchmark data set to uh, to forward us to, I'd be happy to. Um, but uh, I, I I don't know if they have a sort of list of benchmark problems that that have become standard, or is there? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not really an expert on the area. I was just curious. <laughs> so, okay, but, okay. Uh, no, so we're, yeah. we're definitely aware of the papers, but but we we basically uh, restricted our experiments to the classics in uh, in ML, which are you know L1 logistic, um, lasso, etc. Okay. Sid. Yes, one other question about the Shapley Folkman. Um, I don't think I completely understood your plot about the duality gap, but. I guess I was wondering, like, is there some sense in which the bound is known to be tight, or are there kind of natural instances where we feel the duality gap should be much smaller, whereas Shapley Folkman is like a oh, worst that's case? A fantastic question. I was hoping someone would uh, allow me to spend the next 45 minutes um, talking about sure. Shapley Folkman because there's a lot to say. So uh, the bound is very, very conservative. And it's conservative for many reasons. Um, and so where should I start? Um, so first here, if you look at the proof mechanism in chapley fogman right? Uh, you are using conic caractéristiques to reduce the number of coefficients in the representation. 
um, and you get n plus d of them. And this number of non-zero coefficients is actually what quantifies the distance between, what controls the distance between the set and its convex hull or non-convexity, right? But if you're going to use an exact representation, the next natural question is how can, how well can you approximate the point X if you allow yourself a little bit of error and a much sparser representation? So the next thing you try is sparse Konica Tadori. And there, the, the question is, of course, uh, uh, a, lo a lot trickier because it, it, it's, it, it's hard to get very tight bounds for uh, sparse character theory in the regime uh, where uh, chaplet fockman is, in, is invoked. And so we, we try to do that using probabilistic arg arguments and sampling results, et cetera, and sort of bernstein sterfling results. And there's a paper out uh, on ArcSieve with some details, but, but you don't get that far. Uh, so you, you get better bounds depending on the sort of structure of your data, the notions of variance, et cetera. Uh, and you can show that you, you get away with a, a close approximation to the point that has a sparser representation, hence a smaller gap between the set and its convex hull. Uh, but intuitively, you expect to be doing much better. But so, to, to answer your question uh, using a first argument, yes, definitely the bound is very conservative because you expect to be able to find good representations, conic representations that are a lot sparser, right? That's the first thing. Now, second, and perhaps a bit more important, uh, if you look at optimization now, uh, you have this objective, which is uh, the, sum, the sum of uh, separable functions. And, and what we've seen is that the duality gap bound is proportional to the number of constraints. And in this example here, the, the constraints are alpha, are, are linear. And so uh, basically the constraint set is a polytope. But notice that uh, the duality gap bound depends on the representation of that polytope, meaning the number of constraints, not on the polytope itself. And that's very important because there are many ways of representing polytopes, some of them much more economical than others, right? And this is the entire story about extended formulations, etc. Suppose I can write a much better extended formulation of my polytope involving much fewer constraints and maybe additional dummy variables which do not impact the duality gap bound, then I would get a much better duality gap bound, right? Uh, with the same problem. But the, 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 the trick here is that it's, I cannot recycle word for word existing results about extended formulations because you can't simplify away some of the variables. So you cannot just uh, plug in all the results about extended formulations inside the um, uh, uh, duality gap uh, bound to, to replace the counting of, of uh, constraints. But for sure, there is a way of optimally writing your polytope that has the smallest possible number of constraints and that produces the tightest possible um, um, uh, duality gap bound, right? So that's one more thing. Madeleine has worked on results that show that you can use the active, the set of active constraints instead of the number of constraints in your duality gap bound. And same thing, you, that, that, that all of these results are written in terms of unstable quantities. You're counting, you're measuring rank, et cetera. Everything you write, you, you write in terms of unstable quantities has a better formulation using stable quantities like numerical rank, um, uh, 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 approxy, um, uh, 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 numerical dimension, et cetera, right? So here too, Everything involving the number of constraints can be written in terms of uh, uh, something like the numerical rank of the constraint matrix and produce tighter bounds. So the answer is yes on all counts. There are multiple ways to make the bound tighter in very intuitive fashion, uh, but none of these are, are completely explicit at this point. And, and a lot of these questions are completely open, but, but for sure there's a lot to be gained both empirically and, and in the bounds themselves. 
And we've done a little bit of, of work in that uh, direction in, in a separate paper, uh, but, but there's a lot more to do there. That's it. I won't take my entire 45 minute budget, but, but I'm happy to go on. <laughs> oh, that was great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex, for uh, coming to Cornell and giving us a great talk. Really appreciate it. Very happy to visit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for dinner. <laughs> <laughs>